keep in mind where we are now. For the first uh, four weeks of this course, we focused on what the structural characteristics of capitalism are. It's in particular characteristics which um, generate antagonistic interest between labor and capital. And at that point, we did not pay a great deal of attention to the political capacities of each actor to um, uh, organize around its interests and to realize those interests. We just said, look, there's two sides. They're pitted against each other, and they're locked in a battle. Last week, we systematically approached the issue of, OK, if they're locked in a battle, who should we expect to typically come out on the winning side of it? Are there systematic reasons that propel one group in a position of power over the other? And I put forward some reasons for why capital has a structural advantage over labor, not just at the level of the system and the way, level at which individual actors pursue their interests, but also in its ability to organize around its interests. And we pointed out how capitalists have an advantage in both aggregating their interests, that is coming to some agreement on what their interests are, and secondly then in mobilizing around those interests on both levels. The consequence is that it should not be surprising that this prediction that Marx is supposed to have made, which is that capitalism creates its own gravedigger, <laughs> and that gravedigger will in fact rise up and overthrow capitalism, that that prediction did not come true in most of the world. It is true that capitalism does create its own gravedigger insofar as it creates a working class. The working class does have an interest in overthrowing capitalism. But there's no reason to expect that it will easily come, uh, uh, come upon the capacity and the organizational ability to actually do so. In fact, the rules of the system are such that workers will typically find it in their interest to simply pursue individual strategies of self-protection rather than collective and organizational strategies. In other words, making and forming a union, creating a union, sustaining it, is something that we should take as unusual in capitalism. We shouldn't regard it as the norm. Hence the willingness and the ability and the actual incidence of workers organizing, we should expect to be low. We should not therefore take it as a refutation of Marxism that capitalism has survived all this time because on the basis of Marx's own description of capitalism, we should expect that workers are going to be on the losing end of most struggles and will in fact find it quite risky and hence irrational to organize on a typical basis. So that explains one very important thing, which is why within capitalism, in the political struggle around their interests, between capital and labor, why it is that the political power should reside with capital. Today, we're, what we're going to address is a second dimension to this, which is overlain on top of the inequalities in political abilities, in political and organizational capacities. What we did last week was we just addressed the organizational capacity of each side without looking at the role of government, the role of state. And if you, even if you ignore the role of government, you see capital has way many advantages over labor. Today what we're going to see is on top of that, when the state steps in and when it mediates between contending sides in this battle between capital and labor, that the state will have a structural, a built-in bias against labor. So there are two sources then for labor's weakness. One is the weakness that arises from its own um, liabilities around collective action. And the second is the weakness that results from the systematic bias within the state towards capital and away from labor. What we examine today then is the roots of what one might call the class bias of the state. The roots of the class bias of the state. The reading for today by Eric Wright is pretty clear. In some ways there's some confusing parts to it. Uh, I'm going to present the argument in a slightly different form than Eric Wright does. I think he's a little confusing and misleading in the way he presents it. So just pay attention. It's, there's overlap, but the lecture is somewhat distinct from Wright's lecture, from Wright's um, article. Okay, within Marxism, there have been over the course of the last century <coughs> three distinct ways of understanding the roots of the class bias of the state. All Marxists agree 
that the state is not neutral. In this respect, every Marxist theory is different from liberal theory or what's called pluralist theories of the state. The default understanding of the state that most um, social scientists and politicians and uh, ideologues work with and still continue to work with is what one might call a pluralist theory. And the pluralist approach to the state says the following. In its basic institutional structure and in its everyday uh, action, the state is fundamentally neutral. It's a neutral institution. Its job is simply to keep the order. Its job is to keep the peace. It passes laws, but the laws that are passed reflect, they reflect simply the um, battle for influence between different actors in society. Society is conceived of as a uh, kind of a uh, constellation of organized interest groups. That's why it's called pluralist theory. Society is a plurality of interest groups. Employers, workers, students, religious organizations, community organizations, ethnic groups, racial organizations. It's split into a whole gamut of different kinds of interest groups. All these groups lobby and struggle amongst themselves to influence the state. Those groups which have the most influence, which win out in this lobbying battle, are the ones that influence policy. So what policy then reflects is two things. The preferences of the policy makers, that's obvious, everybody agrees on that. And then this sort of jostling that occurs between social groups, different constituencies who have their representatives, who have their lobbyists within government. Within pluralist theory, it is not uh, accepted that any one group is going to have a systematic advantage over others. They all organize around their interests and they all have various advantages and various liabilities. How it nets out, it's impossible to say. So there's two sources then of state neutrality with regard to class struggle. The state is institutionally neutral. That is, there's nothing in the rules of the state's reproduction that bias it one way or the other. And secondly, society is an agglomeration of different interest groups none of which has a systematic advantage over the other. There's momentary advantages, conjunctural advantages, but not systematic. Okay? Marxists, in fact, almost all radical theories, even non-Marxist ones, systematically differ from this argument, fundamentally differ from it. And the argument that Marxists put forward is the state is not neutral. It's intrinsically biased towards one side, and that's capital. Hence, when it intervenes, when it mediates the disputes, it'll mediate them in such a way that it discriminates against labor interests. The state is therefore a capitalist state. All right, well, that's the argument Marxists make. The question is, how do they support it? What are the sources of the state's bias? Why is it not neutral? Yeah, that's the idea. All right, over the time, over time, rather, there have been three distinct arguments that Marxists have made about the sources of the state's bias, which I'll put forward. And here's what the structure is going to be of what I, the argument I make today. First of all, I'm going to lay out what the sources of class bias are within the state. Then, we will locate how, within the constraints that this bias imposes, nevertheless, labor can, under particular conditions, push forward its own interests more or less successfully. So that we will have an understanding not only of why the state inclines towards capital, but of the conditions under which that bias towards capital can be weakened and pushed in the other direction. Yeah? And then finally, I'll put forward some thoughts as to how, what the limits are to how far labor can push in the other direction. Okay? All right. So, um, this argument that I'm putting forward differs from Eric Wright's in a couple of crucial respects. For the, there are three levels of influence or bias, three independent sources of bias within the state. The first one is what I call situational or interpersonal. This is at the level of individuals. The second is an institutional pressure. And the third is structural. 
for most of the history of Marxist thought, for most of its history, that is up until the 1940s and 50s, when Marxists talked about the class bias of the state, the source of that bias was located in the first dimension or the second, never the third. Almost never, I should say, the third. So when we're going through these sources of bias, you should keep in mind that there's also kind of a temporal dimension to it. The third source of the state's bias is one that's really been theorized only very recently. Um, even though it was sort of implicit in much of what Marx was saying and in much of what Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky were saying, they never really made it explicit. It was the first two that they concentrated on. Furthermore, the third, each dimension does not negate or deny the effects of the preceding one. It simply says that there are deeper mechanisms that keep the state's bias in place. Deeper such that if the preceding one is neutralized somehow, the bias will still remain. The way I've organized this is each mechanism, it's not just a random ordering. The third mechanism is more fundamental than the second, and the second is more fundamental than the third. Which is another way of saying that if the first disappears, the second still kicks into action. And if the second disappears, the third will kick into action. If the third disappears, you're no longer in capitalism. All right? OK. So what is the first? This refers to the situational or interpersonal characteristics about state managers. The characteristics of people manning. When I say state managers, what I mean is two things. Politi the people who make policy, politicians on the one hand, and the top levels of the bureaucracy on the other. I don't mean clerks in the post office. Okay? What I mean is the top levels of the state that actually sets policy. So what is it about people, the individual characteristics of those people that inclines their policy making in a capitalist direction? What is it about it? Well, but fundamentally it's A, their own personal identities. The fact that most people who are recruited into the uppermost echelons of government themselves come from the capitalist class. So there's been study after study after study in most advanced capitalist countries, which is shown, especially the US, the, in England, these have been the way that's been studied most deeply. If you look at the top people in positions of power in government, they're people who were recruited either through, either from investment banks, corporate law offices, the, the biggest corporations, or the various think tanks and uh, uh, brokerage houses around those corporations. So you think of Cheney, you think of Rumsfeld, George Bush, uh, he's, a, he's a failed capitalist, but he is a capitalist, right? And anybody who's in the Treasury Department will come out of the financial community, investment banks, etc. It is their own identities. If not their identities, it's the social networks in which they travel, within which they circulate. There's actually been research on this as well. What are the networks of the people in the uppermost echelons of government? The networks are networks which put them in the same room or same club or same restaurant or same drama hall as other capitalists. So the moral universe and the cultural universe in which they circulate is one where labor is entirely absent, where popular organizations are absent. So the basic idea is, since these people circulate in these groups, originate from these groups, hang out with these groups, their personal loyalties are going to be with those groups. Their view of the world, their moral universe, their conception of what's right and wrong, their conception of what's adequate and inadequate, what's just and unjust, is going to come from those groups and reflect the values and the dispositions of capitalists. Hmm? All right. So the fact that politicians are situationally in the same networks as capitalists and have interpersonal ties with them or are themselves from the capitalist class will incline them in a capitalist direction. All right. Now, that is a powerful mechanism, there's no doubt. But it cannot possibly explain, as a rule, why capitalist states incline towards labor for the following reason. Up until the 1930s and 40s, it was certainly true that across the capitalist world, the only people who could ever wield political power were either from the capitalist class or from its social milieu, its social networks. But by the 1930s and 40s, across the world, you got parties coming into political power 
that were explicitly labor parties, that were explicitly parties that whose leadership came from a different social milieu than did traditional elite parties. Yet, those parties did not overthrow capitalism once they came to power. The policies were less anti-labor, but they were still capitalist. You got a cold? You look kind of heavy head kind of look. Mm. Allergies. Indians don't get allergies. No? Um, so how do you explain that? That poses an explanatory kind of challenge. How do you exp what properties of the state are there that would keep these line these parties in line? Because now the situational and interpersonal ties of people in power have changed. They're not capitalists themselves. They're coming from a different milieu. Okay, the explanation that kicks in at this point is, it's not just the characteristics of individuals. It's also two things. One is the institutional ties, not personal ties now. It's the institutional ties between people in power and capitalists, the wealthy and the investing class. What do we mean? Think about the United States. When politicians come into power, it's not just their personal networks that incline them in one position. It's also the, it's the fact, an institutional fact about how they achieve power in the first place. And the institutional fact about how they achieve power is what? What do you need to get if you're a politician to be able to be elected into office? Huh? Money. Money. Before votes, it's money. So but what that means is a politician who's in power, when he's confronted with two conflicting demands, a demand coming from an individual voter and a demand coming from an individual funder, is not going to look at them the same way. The voter signifies nothing but one vote. The funder signifies not just one vote, but the resources that are necessary to capture 100 votes. In the United States, that's the most accentuated of any country in the world. Now, this is a fact. I call it an institutional fact. Because it doesn't, the, the politician can hate the funder personally. And he may not identify in his own culture and his own value um, universe with the funder. But institutionally, that is, it's a fact about how elections are organized, that if he wants to stay in power, he's going to have to give a privileged position to the demands that the funder is making. In fact, uh, there's a, a famous paper that a political scientist wrote called The Investment Theory of Voting. And what the political scientist said, his name is Tom Ferguson. If, um, if you have time, you should look this up. Ferguson says that in the United States, in a system like the US, which is fundamentally money driven, politicians don't compete for votes. That's a second order competition for them. The first thing they compete over is funders. So the first thing politicians compete over is funders. And through capturing the funders, they have the ability to then compete over votes. It's not that votes are irrelevant. It's that if you don't get the funders, you have no chance of even getting to the votes. Because the whole system depends on individual fundraising on the part of the politician. Okay, that's an institutional fact. You see the, the, the difference? It's not a fact about personal preferences, personal loyalties, or personal identity of the people in power, which is what this refers to. It's a fact about the institutional rules about how elections are organized, which makes them dependent on the wealthy. A second institutional fact is the structure of lobbying. So politicians are more sensitive to the appeals of the wealthy. But if you, look, if you flip it over and look at it from the standpoint of the wealthy, interest group theory says, look, pluralist theory says, everybody is lobbying all the time. And whoever wins will have the influence on policy. What radicals say is, yeah, that's true. It's absolutely true. Everybody lobbies all the time. But you'd be a fool to think that the playing field is level. Lobbying requires resources. Lobbying requires influence. It requires getting people together. And lobbying, therefore, is a form of collective action. So all the things I said last week about collective action and the imbalance in collective action kicks into action when you consider lobbying. Capitalists will always have more money to get the most influential lobbyists, to get the slickest advertising campaigns, to get the right lawyers for them. And labor will, A, not have the money to hire lo lobbyists. B, if it does gather up the money, it'll always be less than uh, capital. The AFL-CIO, which 
true, con controls billions of dollars, accounted for 124th of the expenditure on campaign funding and finance that corporate donors did in the 2000 election. That in the entire might of labor put together was a, just 124th of what capital was able to do. Hmm? So in the lobbying process, capital always has an advantage, which means then it's a double whammy. Politicians are more sensitive to the demands of capitalists because that's where the funding comes from. The funding to the individual politician. And secondly, capitalists are more able to get into the door to make their voices heard because they have more resources to wield for collective action. Right? Both of these together then act as a powerful inducement for politicians to cater first to the interests of the wealthy and to capitalists and then, if at all, to the interests of labor. Yeah? Now notice, both of these, these sources of bias have one thing in common. They function through either individual loyalties and identities that incline politicians towards capital or the individual influence of capitalists on the politicians. Both of them require some degree of interpersonal connection with capitalists as individuals. Either the people are themselves capitalists, or their friends are capitalists, or they depend on the personal um, favor of capitalists. Right? So both, but they are together, they, are, they have something in common, which is that they refer to ways in which individual capitalists have influence on the state. It takes individual action, collective action, but individuals have to do something. The third structural level is not just distinct from the other, either of the other two, but distinct from both of them combined. And to motivate it, let me again offer a thought experiment. I mentioned earlier that from the 30s onward, a theory that relied purely on the personal <coughs> identities of politicians couldn't account for the state's bias because people were coming into office that didn't identify with capitalists. But something else also happened after the 30s, which called for a deeper account of the state's bias, which is parties got into office that were not only distinct from capitalist parties, but were parties that were fundamentally in their program anti-capitalist. The most dramatic example was Allende in Chile. But Mitterrand in 1980 was supposedly, he came up on an anti-capitalist platform. And even in the 1930s, the social democratic parties that came to power in Scandinavia, for example, were parties that were programmatically committed to socialism. So not only were they distinct from capital, not only were the individuals not from the capitalists, they were ideologically opposed to it. They were calling for the undermining of capitalism. And even in this case, Every one of these parties ended up, in the end, conforming to capitalism. So you needed to have an account for how that could happen, since neither of these conditions was in place. <coughs> you getting this? Neither of them was in place. The explanation that Marxists have developed for why even anti-capitalist parties will end up, typically, will end up conforming to the rules of capitalism and hence privileging the interests of capital has to do with the structural relationship between the state and, its, and capitalism. The structural position of the state within capitalism. And that's the following. No matter what the ideological inclination of a particular government, of the people in power, even if you're left wing, you face a dilemma. And the dilemma is, whatever programs you want to put into place, whatever duration of time you want to stay, into, stay in power, you're in a situation where you depend, as a state, on a regular inflow of revenue. Because whatever you want to do, it requires expenditure in some way or form. Whatever you want to do, it requires keeping the state solvent and afloat and paying salaries to bureaucrats. There's a span of time, even if you're, you have a government committed to overthrowing capitalism, unless it does it like this, for any span of time that's going to be the duration in which it's implementing its policies, it's going to require revenues to favor the groups, even if it's labor, that are its privileged constituency, 
and just to pay the salaries and the bills every day at an everyday level. That being the case, it confronts a dilemma, which is in capitalism, where does revenue to the state come from? Well, not, yes. Capital, <coughs> indirectly. The, the proximate source of revenue is taxation for every state. Indirect taxes, direct taxes, etc. Well, what is taxed? Income. income. Whether it's corporate income, capital income, personal income coming from wages. Whether it's income coming from capital, profits, or from wages, it's income. And here's the fundamental problem. What is the source of income? Employment. Hmm? Employment. So here's the problem the state faces. If it gets into power on a program that is specifically anti-capitalist or that is aimed at making inroads into capitalist profits to shift income towards labor, capitalists see it as a direct attack on their own profit making. Not even if it's not on property per se. It's a set of policies that's going to drag down profitability, right? Either by raising wages high so that wages start eating into profits, right? Or by putting regulations in place that are also raise the cost of capital. Yeah, health and safety regulations, environmental controls, all of these have the effect of raising capital's costs, right? It's costly to put into place new machinery that's safer. It's costly to ignore <coughs> production techniques that uh, pollute the environment or to internalize the costs of pollution. If capital sees policies as being inimical to its interests, what's its response going to be? Its response is going to be to say either, fuck it, I'm not investing. There's no point investing in a country where I can't get an acceptable rate of return. Or it's going to say, I'm just going to get out of here and go to Mexico or China or wherever. Lastly, as the last resort, it'll say, I'm just going to sit pat. The effect is going to be, I'm going to sit pat. The profits that I'm making, I'm just going to park them in a bank and hold my breath, basically. The effect of any one of these measures is a slowdown in economic growth. A slowdown in economic growth coming from a slowdown in investment. As investment slows down, growth slows down, job creation slows down. As job creation slows down, income growth slows down. And as income growth slows down, what happens to tax revenues? So the state faces then the following problem. If it implements policies that capital regards as unacceptable, it faces the possibility of a response on the part of capital that drags down the rate of growth because capital always has the freedom not to invest. It controls the surplus. Ben, are you getting this? Why are you frowning? Okay. <laughs> if capital slows down investment, the rate of growth goes down, revenue goes down, and now the state is left with nothing, no resources with which to enact its own policies. There's another avenue to this. If investment slows down, job growth slows down. If job growth slows down, what happens to job employments? The, what, what happens to unemployment? It goes up. If people don't have jobs, what's the response with regard to politicians? They vote them out of office. And here's the irony. You're brought into office by a working class base that wants you to put progressive policies in place you put progressive policies in place and your same constituency votes you out of office. The constraint, therefore, is the following. Within capitalism, the fundamental fact about capitalism is the surplus out of which investment comes out is privately controlled and privately owned. And the volition, the willingness of capitalists to invest that surplus depends on their perceptions about whether or not they'll make an acceptable rate of return completely subjective. There's no objective or um, naturally based criterion on what is and is not an acceptable rate of return. It's subjective. Can you do that again? Yeah. Constraint? What's that? What is the constraint? Yeah. Uh, just the fact about capitalism is growth in capitalism depends on <laughs> private investment. That is investment that's privately controlled. Yeah? 
It's privately controlled means individual agents have the power to say yes or no on an investment decision. Either they'll invest or they won't. They'll invest only so long as they think they can make an acceptable rate of return. If government policies, therefore, are seen to be, expected to be, this is pure, this, this, we're talking about a guess about the future here, okay? This, and this is a crucial point, I'll come back to it later, because this is also the way out. If policies are expected to be a drag on profits, the capitalist response will most likely be to withhold investment, which brings down the ability of the government to do anything. Because it, just, it can't even pay the bills anymore. Now, that being the case, the state, anybody who takes power in the state, they don't even have to be told this. They know it the moment they enter. The moment they take power, the first thing they think of is not what can I do for my constituency, but what can I do to keep business investment healthy and uh, afloat. In other words, the way in the jargon, the first thing they think about is the investment climate. How do I maintain the investment climate? And the investment climate then acts as a trump. Anything you do has to be policy that's consistent with a buoyant investment climate. Now that's a fancy way of saying what capitalists have in, 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 the, in the capitalist mode of production is the power to extort everybody else. What capitalists basically say is, I control the money. And as long as I am happy, the rest of you can have jobs and you can have some government programs. But it's your job to convince me that you're looking out for my interests. It's not my job to convince you to look after my interests. It's your job to convince me. The thing about the structural power of capital is this. In these two settings, these two instruments, these two mechanisms, capitalists are themselves acting to press forward, to press their interests onto the state. Either because capitalists are themselves the state or because they're lobbying the state. What I'm telling you now is they don't have to. Because of the structural location of the state within capitalism, state managers have to make it their business to think constantly about the welfare and the happiness of capitalists. What that means is that at a systemic level, capitalists do not actually have to act collectively, organize around their interests, just to maintain the the basic bias of the state towards them. State managers internalize this themselves and they make it their own business to f privilege capitalists' welfare and interests. This is a very powerful conclusion and I'll repeat it again. Within capitalism, within capitalism, the state makes it its business to cater to capital, even if it's a social democratic state. Because, and it's not because it's corrupt. It's because the rules of the game are such that a precondition to serving anyone else's interests is to first serve capital's interests. Again, just to keep with the theme so far, no, no need to refer to false consciousness, no need to refer to ideology, nothing. What state managers realize, they're not deceived. It's a, it is in fact true of capitalism that capitalists have the power to make everybody else worry about them. Hmm? So uh, the irony then is this. In earlier versions of Marxist theory, it was typically um, argued and insisted upon that the reason the state is always capitalist is that capitalists control the state because of these two fe features about the state. Now, as a fact about capitalism, as a historical fact, it's true. Capitalists typically control the state. But even in the instances where they don't, and even in the instances where people manning positions of power have been hostile to capitalism, they have had to conform to the basic rules of the game. Because the rules of the game are such that if you don't first look at the capitalist interests, 
the economy goes into a tank. And when that happens, the first agent that's looked at as a culprit is not capital, but the government, but the state. And the state itself loses any ability to do anything because it has no more revenue, it has no more resources. That's, I'm uh, presenting this in a very pointed way, right? There are things you can do. You can have deficit financing, you can print money and all that. But it doesn't erase this basic fact that the state is swimming faster and faster just to stay afloat. Yeah. So what about like the case of Venezuela? First, we want to deal with the basic picture at a highly abstract level. Then we want to make it more and more complex and look at the mediations. The, the point about presenting it at this level of abstraction in this way is to say that even in Venezuela, this isn't going to change unless they simply do away with capitalism. As long as they're within capitalism, they're going to have to worry about what private capitalists think, about what private capitalists, about their assessments of the investment climate. And Chavez has been explicit about this. He, he said, I, I'm not going to expropriate capitalists. I'm just going to outcompete them. Well, good luck. If you think you're going to, you know, I mean, it might work. We'll see. Yeah, Harry. So now, Chile is a very good example of this. Because what happened in Chile? Allende comes to power. What, what happens the moment he comes into power? Chilean capital goes on what's called an investment strike. You know this concept, investment strike? It is when capitalists decide as a collective, we're not, this, this workers say we're not going to um, allow the use of our asset, labor power, when workers go on strike. Capitalists said, we're going to hold back our asset. And our asset is the means of production. So the Chilean economy tanks. And Allende, at, from like the seventh or eighth month of his administration, everything he's doing, everything is geared towards finding a way of getting the economy going again. Now, I'll, th in the rest of this lecture, I'll come to the means through which Allende or anybody else can fight against these constraints. The first thing I want to lay out is the constraints themselves. Now we want to get to, all right, what are the options open to labor, to you know, oppressed communities through class struggle to push forward and press upon the state their interests? Because what this paints is a pretty hopeless picture. What's going on? Ah. On, the, on this basis, you should be asking a very important question, which is, if this is true, how did social democracy ever come about at all? What this points to is a kind of a despotism of capital, right? Okay. The answer is to, has to do with this. The, uh, the fact that social democracy come about doesn't mean that these constraints don't exist. It's that there are means and instruments available to loosen the constraints, even if you can't do away with them. To loosen them so that a state can be made not neutral with respect to the class struggle and not consistently pro-labor, but its pro-capitalist bias can be diluted and weakened so that it's less hostile to labor. So think of it as the following way. Every capitalist state is going to be hostile to labor, but not every capitalist state will be equally hostile to labor. And the extent to which they're hostile to labor depends on other conditions which push in the opposite direction of these. All right? So I want to now approach those. Everybody clear on this? All right. Now, I want to now introduce a second structural fact about the state. The basic structural fact that I pointed to, you've got allergies too? Either that or it's a really <laughs> devastating lecture because you're both crying. <laughs> Tears streaming out of their eyes. I mean, I know it's sad, but you don't have to take it personally. All right. So the first structural fact is that cap the state depends on capital accumulation. Like, and Merry Christmas. All I've told you is, like any, everybody else, the state depends on capital accumulation. Capital is the first concept I introduced to you in this course, and now you know why. We keep coming back to it every time. It's the source of power and the source of the system's dynamism at the same time. So the state depends on capital accumulation. The second institutional, the structural fact then is The state 
this a very this is a bit of jargon, but I'll come to it. Early Marxist theory. It was historically right that states in the early parts of the 20th century were captured by capitalists. It was a these were states in which power was, uh, at the uppermost echelons was in the hands of individual capitalists, and they captured the state. It was historically right, but it was institutionally and structurally fundamentally mistaken. The implication of early Marxist theory was, and in some of Marx's own aphorisms, when he said the state is nothing but the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the executive committee of the bourgeoisie. The implication there is that the state in capitalism is not just contingently and temporarily, but necessarily always captured by capitalists. Yeah? But this is a fact about capitalists, uh, capitalism as a system that uh, is, fun, is misleading in important ways. Because while it may be true that the state in certain situations is captured by capitalists, political power itself and institutionally the state itself is an entirely distinct institution from the economy. Unlike, say, the feudal state, which was um, organizationally fused with the economy. In capitalism, the state is a distinct organization from economic organizations. It can make any law it wants and anybody can, in theory, get into power. In a feudal sitting, the lord of the manor, it was built into the system that the lord of the manor would be the feudal lord. He was the judge in the manor court. He was the presiding authority in military affairs. And of course, he had controlled the surplus as well. In a feudal setting, therefore, the state was fused with the economy. Economic relations and political relations went hand in hand. The, the individual agent who controlled economic resources also controlled political power, always. Why? Because political power was actually the precondition for controlling the economy. If the lord lost control of his military, of his retinue, he couldn't get a surplus out of the peasants. So the only way to control the surplus was to first control the state. Military, political, and economic power were therefore fused. In capitalism, political power and economic power is institutionally separate. That is to say, capitalists can keep making their profits even if they don't control government. All they need to control is what? The labor force, right? All they need to control is their workers. Doesn't matter who's controlling government. In theory, therefore, they're completely distinct spheres. That's why it's puzzling. It's puzzling that despite being completely different spheres, there's such a coalescence of interests between them. Yeah? Now, what I've done in, so far in the lecture is try to explain why, despite being different spheres, different institutions, there is nevertheless a structural and systematic compulsion on the state to look, cater and privilege to the needs of capitalists. But that institutional separation also presents an opportunity for labor. Hmm? And the opportunity then is simply this. Because the state need not be in the hands of capitalists, there are situations where it may not be. And the question is, when it is not in the hands of capitalists, how can labor organizations, how can workers' organizations, organizations of the poor, put countervailing pressures in place that makes the state less hostile to labor? Now, the answer to that is simple, which is just class struggle. The, the question is, how does class struggle work on the state's inbuilt bias? How does it do it? Did I, I don't remember, did I talk last week about how labor management can extract concessions from its employers? Not the state, but from employers? All right, let me just go through that first. And then I'll, it's the same principle that works with the state. And then I'll shut down, all right? Okay, think of em employees. Remember, the, lo <sighs> okay. the logic of how uh, the state caters to the interests of capitalists is actually quite similar to how workers also must think 
about the interests of their employers. Remember, when a worker is in an employ uh, a site, whatever side of work site he's in, he wants some sort of change. Yeah? It requires making a demand on his employer. Okay, if he goes to, to make a demand as an individual, his fear is that he'll be fired. So he has two uh, responses to that, potential responses. One is, he'll make the kind of demand that is not taken to be so egregious by his employer, so offensive that he'll fire him. Instead, he'll make a demand that the employer might actually consider. So he tones down the range of demands he makes. The other possible response is that he doesn't tone down the response, the demand that he makes, but he tries to increase his bargaining power. So that the demand, even the demand that, he, that is the demand that he wants to make, that demand can in fact be made. Well, how does he increase his bargaining power? He organizes, right? All right. And last week, then we went into all the obstacles that go into organizing. But imagine for a second that they succeed. It does happen. So imagine that these workers in a work site or across a sector succeed in forming a union. And they impress upon their employer these demands. And the employer says, screw you. No way. Their response is then going to be what? They go on strike. OK, now you've got class struggle. Class struggle. You've heard of it. It's a joke. <laughs> you got class struggle. But the question is, under what conditions? Is, the mere fact that you've gone on strike doesn't mean you're going to win. In fact, in the US, usually it means you're going to lose. What are the sources, then, of capital's advantage when it confronts a strike? You've got a strike. The what? The government. No, forget the government for a second. Yeah. Hmm? Bringing in new people. Breaking the strike, save it with violence, right? Imagine that none of these things is used by capital. They don't bring in scabs. They don't break up the strike. They don't bring in, use the reserve army of labor and hire new people. Exactly. Even if you take all that other shit away, there's still the fact that workers are without a job for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. The strikers are without a job. What are they relying on when they're without a job? Well, at the most, two things. A strike fund and their individual savings. OK, their savings are going to be for shit. They're workers. So basically what we're talking about is a strike fund. All strike funds run out. All strike funds are going to run out. The capitalist, on the other hand, has his own savings, which is going to be, what, do you estimate, high or low? Okay. Secondly, because he's a capitalist, he's got the entire financial community behind him. He just walks into a bank and he says, look, I need a loan. Because he's a capitalist, he can get these loans. If a worker walks into a bank and says, I need a loan, and before he can spell out his name, he's going to be out on his ass. Who's going to give an unemployed worker a loan to eke out an existence during a strike. The fundamental resource that capitalists have going for them is their wealth. Hmm? And this is very, very important. They can resort to all these other things, but even if they fail, they have their wealth. What does labor have going for it? Well, fundamentally what it has going for it is its numbers. And this is very important. And that's why we talked about solidarity last week, right? If the numbers, the only way to maintain the numbers is to get people to incur, to willingly undertake the sacrifices that the strike involves. And the fundamental sacrifice is you're living on nothing. And that's the inducement employers use to get people to come back to work as scabs, right? They say, how long can you hold out? How long is this? I'm never going to relent. The capitalist says, I'm never going to give in. How long do you think you got four kids? How long do you think you can hold out? All right, this, what he's working on is the worker's understanding of this imbalance in resources. The worker knows this guy can hold out, right? So what do workers have going for them? What they, yes. What they have going for them is the capitalist is also losing something. And what he's losing is he's not producing. In the time that the workers are on strike, he ain't producing. Which means his competitors have the ability to move into the market, to take away his market share, right? 
Now, this is the key. First of all, it tells you two things. Never go on strike during a recession. Never go on strike when inventories are built up and the capitalist is looking for ways to shed inventory. Always go on strike when the capitalist is looking to produce more. Right? But the second thing it tells you is the strength of the workers is to make the strike costly to capital. And let's call this, I, it's a cumbersome term, but I call it the cost of obstructionism. Capitalists, when they confront a strike, they're obstructionists. They say, screw you. They obstruct the fulfillment of workers' demands. The key for unions for workers is to make it costly. You raise the cost of obstructionism. How do you do it? And all of this is legitimate. All right, you go on strike. For one thing, you break some of the machinery. Uh, <laughs> edit that out. <laughs> um, you do little things. You, 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 know, you, you make the machinery. You destroy it. You break it up a little bit. But most importantly, what you want it, you, you strategize. This is where strategy comes in. You can't just up and go on strike. Timing is important. You time the strike at such a point that it hurts the capitalist where he lives, which is his pocketbook, not just his personal income. He can, he'll clobber you at the personal income level every time. But remember what a capitalist is. He is the personification of capital. So while he'll remain rich, he also wants to remain a capitalist. And he can be rich without being a capitalist. He can be a failure. And Donald Trump is a failure as a capitalist. He's, the, he's a complete buffoon. In the real estate industry, nobody takes him. So he, he, people think he's a colossal failure. He's personally very wealthy because his genius isn't in real estate. It's in branding himself. He sells himself and he's become a brand name. As a real estate developer, he's not very successful at all. They want to be successful as capitalists, so what do you do? You make it difficult for them to be capitalists. You do things like, you go on strike when it hurts them the most. You organize lateral actions with other firms, right, who might be in the same industry. Because now what you're doing is, you're organizing them and you're, their employers are going to say to your employer, what the fuck is going on, man? Not only have you sent your own guys out on strike, you're sending my guys out on strike now? Settle with them, right? You organize up and down the production chain. You bring to bear pressure on the guy from, and the pressure comes in the form of either his losing profits or others losing profits and their loss of profits being a source of pressure on him. Yeah? It's the cost of obstruction. You make it costly for him to resist you. This is why the more you organize, the more effective you are as workers. Yeah? Okay. The same principle applies to the state. And here's how. If a political party gets into power, the constraint that it faces is that if it... They, you know, I don't know why they allow motorbikes in large These cities. Huh? Capitalists. It's a what? These capitalists. Capitalists, yeah. Man. Um, a party that gets into power it faces the constraint of the structural dependence on the, of the state on capital, right? How then can it push through policies that are pro-labor pro if the worry is about capitalists holding back their investment? The way to do it is you mobilize the same way as you would mobilize in the workplace, and you do it in the following way. The only time social democracy, social democratic parties have been effective when they've gotten into power is upon getting into power, there's also a massive mobilization from below. What does the massive mobilization from below do? Well, if it includes things like strikes, if it includes things like direct action of various kinds, what it's doing is, it's not simply leading the implementation of progressive policy to the politicians themselves. What it's doing is, it's creating pressure on politicians from below through two sources. One is directly on the politician, in the following way. Just the way that you make it costly on capitalists to resist your demands. You make it ex costly for politicians to resist your demands. How? Well, a politician is saying, look, if I put into place pro-labor policies, there'll be an investment strike. Hmm? Slow down investment, increase unemployment, and I'll be punished by being thrown out of office. You go Organizations representing 10,000 people say, yeah, you might think you're going to be kicked out of office if there's an investment strike, but we'll guarantee you you're kicked out of office if you don't do what we're saying, because we, ha we have 10,000 votes behind us. 
there is the possibility in the future that capital might engage in an investment strike. You don't know that it will. We can guarantee that we won't vote for you next time. What have you done for him? Done to him? You have made it costly for him to resist you. Costly for the politician. A second way in which you make it costly is indirectly by making it costly for capitalists. How? Think of the New Deal. This is where the FDR example comes in. FDR doesn't pass the New Deal because of his own inclinations. He was, there was nothing in his history to suggest that he was friendly to labor. In fact, FDR's history suggested he had no views on anything. It's kind of like Clinton. He had no real views on anything. What happens though? He comes to power at a time when there is the biggest wave of industrial action that the United States had seen in a half century. Now, two things happen. He can go to capitalists and say, you are now facing a wave of escalating protests and strike activities that are threatening to get out of control. We have the possibility of letting some of this pressure out. And I'll tell you how. Let me pass through these reforms, which will take some of the wind out of the sails of the labor movement because it will give them something. But if you don't let me do this, they could take the whole game. And the next guy who comes in might have to push through reforms that are way more radical than what I'm proposing because eight or ten months from now they're going to want a lot more. They'll be more pissed, they'll be better organized, and they'll be more militant. So do it now. He does not appeal to the goodwill of the capitalist. He appeals to their profit-making inclination. He says, give them something now or be forced to give them more down the line. A second way in which this works is capitalists themselves come over to the state and say, hey, you better do something. And this is actually what happened in the New Deal. The New Deal was not simply FDR confronting an entire capitalist class saying, we've got to give them something. Big chunks of the American bourgeoisie actually defected over to the Democratic Party and said, the rest of these, our colleagues, the rest of our class has its head up its ass. And it doesn't realize that unless we allow some reforms, we're going to go under. So they come over and they put pressure on the state, look, you better do something. For both of these sources of pressure, directly on the politician or indirectly through capital, it's the same source, which is mass mobilization. But mobilization that doesn't sing kumbaya, do seances and light vigils. It's mobilization that is, makes it costly to ignore it. That's why I said last week, organizing is about shutting things down not about symbolically making your voice heard. If you shut things down, it becomes costly to ignore you. And then, ruling classes are comparing two costs. The cost of giving you the concessions versus the cost of not giving you the concessions. And you've got to be powerful enough as a movement to make the cost of not giving you concessions greater than the cost of giving you the concessions. Yeah. The reason this can work under capitalism is because the state and the economy are distinct. Because the state is autonomous, you can push it in this direction. Yeah? Now, it just, the question is how far can you push it? In some social democratic, this is the last five minutes and I'll stop. In some element, wings of social democracy, the idea was, look, if we just combine this strategy, a mass mobilizational strategy with a progressive party in place, we can go the whole route. We can go out of capitalism. Um, perhaps. Perhaps. The, typically, though, what happens is movements don't last forever. Movements push through a certain, they reach a certain threshold, they reach a crescendo, and after that, as reforms get passed, movements start demobilizing. And as they demobilize, the pressure on the state recedes. And as the pressure on the state recedes, the other source of pressure on politicians, which is the pressure coming from capital's interests, remains in place. The pressure from below recedes, the pressure from on high remains in place. Politicians now start approaching concessions differently than they did when the movement was at its peak. Now they start thinking of ways in which the demands can be tweaked, changed, uh, filtered so as to make them less and less and less threatening to capital. Hmm? Because they have more and more ability to do that. As that happens, the constraints from capital side start becoming, once again, more and more binding. <laughs>
So the autonomy of the state, therefore, never becomes absolute. It remains only relatively autonomous. It's a limited autonomy. Hmm? How limited any given state will auto, uh, any given state's autonomous tah, how limited any given state's autonomy will be depends, therefore, on the class struggle. When the class struggle is heightened, when labor is mobilized, when it's on the streets the state's autonomy from capital will increase. As labor mobilization recedes, the state's autonomy from capital also declines until you can actually end up with the state being recaptured physically by capitalists through the first two dimensions of power. So what this gives you then is a fully a kind of a three-dimensional, multi-dimensional understanding of the state what the sources of its class bias are, and what the instruments and institutions are that can weaken the class bias. The extent to which that class bias can then be eclipsed, and whether or not it can actually be dissolved, so that this kind of mobilizational strategy leads you out of capitalism, well, we haven't seen it yet. So I'm not confident that it can work. But in normal circumstances, the state's autonomy, the state's autonomy from capital is real, but limited. How limited depends on how mobilized and organized the working class is. Because in normal circumstances the class bias is there, you therefore have two sources of stability within capitalism that keep labor at a disadvantaged position. The first source of stability is the organizational and <clears throat> mobilizational advantages that capital has over labor, which we discussed last week. The second source of stability is the state and its intrinsic and institutional bias to cater to the interests of capital first. Labor, therefore, faces an extraordinary challenge. First, it has to overcome its, intr its internal weaknesses with regard to collective action. Once it organizes, it then faces the uh, resource advantages of its employers, even if it organizes and goes on strike. And atop the power of the employers, there's the organized power of the state, which is always inclined towards employers. Now, if you really want to get serious, as I said last week, there's three obstacles. The first obstacle, actually, is the, is labor unions, the labor union leadership itself which is almost always hostile to labor action. That being the case, it's extraordinary that radical intellectuals in the 70s and 80s, when they abandoned Marxism, took the absence of labor militancy as a sign that Marxist theory was wrong. Given Marxist theory, it's extraordinary that labor militancy ever makes its face, ever presents its face at all. And everything that I've said today come straight out of the basic assumptions of Marxist theory itself, not through modifying it or tweaking it. So if you take nothing else away from this close course, understand the fact that being a Marxist doesn't mean that you're committed to the view that there's going to be labor unions and class struggle popping up everywhere. It takes extraordinarily hard work. Every rule in the system is geared towards making it impossible. You got to talk louder to go. In the paper, Eric Wright, when he asked, when he talked about the institutional power, he, he, he mentioned negative power. Yeah, he, you know, that's a bunch of fancy schmancy. There's no point. The filtering. Yeah. Uh, if people really want to get into that, I can do that. But um, basically, what it says is this what the state's dependence on capital does is it makes politicians when they're confronted with a set of demands, it makes them filter out all the most radical demands. Why? Because they're worried that the radical demands will dampen the investment climate. And their first concern is to keep investment buoyant. That's why what labor can never do is what it in fact does in America, which is go over to the Democrats, give them the, a list of things labor wants done, and then go back home. What the Democrats do is say, yeah, fine. They'll file it away somewhere.
Now, mind you, for 98% of everything you ever want to know about the state, the first two sources of bias are all you need to know. I mean, that's why this theory, that's the form it took for 100 years. The structural constraints on the state almost never have to kick in because states n rarely actually try to implement policies that are anti-capitalist. The structural constraint makes its presence felt not because states push against what capitalists are willing to tolerate, capitalists go on an investment strike and then states draw back. That's not how it makes its presence felt. It does it because every politician who gets into power knows that his first job is to think about his first job is to think about capital. It wouldn't even enter his head to impose anti-capitalist policies. So the, the negative power is that, that it just it filters out a whole bunch of demands. Last week, so you probably maybe covered this, but I think you said labor union leadership was hostile to labor action. Yeah. It's a it's a tough one because it, it came at the end of a very long lecture, uh, and I can't repeat that whole thing. <laughs> but the basic reason is that. Um, but that article that mentioned it a bit. Yeah, it does. It does mention it a bit. The basic reason is that labor leaderships. Uh, usually become permanent staffers. And uh, the, the, so the first thing that happens is their income is from a different source than the workers. Secondly, labor leaderships maintain their positions in power for two reasons. Uh, one is by giving to their constituency some kind of gains that come with a new contract. But the other is um, through keeping management happy that in that management gives the union positive signals that these leaders are people we can deal with. Now, the labor leadership has enormous pressures on it, not just from its constituency, but from management, to deliver on every contract. Management says, look, we'll give you this contract, but you've got to promise us no job actions for the next two years. You've got to promise us that they'll work at a certain pace. And you've got to promise us that there'll be a certain level of discipline. Right? Now, a militant labor leadership will say, fuck you. We, we're going to agree to such and such terms. Beyond that, our discipline, et cetera, depends on how you're acting. Okay, that's not easy to do. There's enormous pressure on the labor leadership to say, yes, we'll do this. Right? So their job becomes policing the workers, the ordinary rank and file. But there's another process underway, which is very important, which is it's difficult for a union unless it's got a very class conscious rank and file, it's difficult for a union to remain vibrant, democratic, open, with everybody participating. So what you start getting in unions is an automatic tendency for the rank and file to kind of become less involved and look to the labor leadership to deliver to it annual, biannual, triannual gains. And their mentality, it's not hard to fall into kind of a service mentality. Now when that happens, the labor leadership becomes kind of an oligarchy. And an oligarchy, the f fundamental thing that it fears is loosening the controls and making a union open and vibrant because once it's an oligarchy, every election cycle is going to be re-elected back into place because nobody else wants to hassle. Nobody's deeply unhappy because they're delivering 2% salary increases every year. They're, they're protecting uh, pensions and retirement benefits, etc. So they kind of get used to their position. And now when management tells them, hey, look, if you can't contain these people, we're just going to send out signals that we want a new leadership. The oligarchy says, well, shit, we've got pretty good lives right now. So they start turning their energies towards keeping the rank and file demobilized and controllable because two things can happen when it's mobilized. It can boot them out of office because there can be a frank and open discussion about the direction that the union's going in. Or it can create enough trouble for management that management says, we're not going to deal with you anymore. You didn't fulfill your obligations to us. 
So whenever a, a, an incumbent leadership sees an active rank and file, it worries. Because it's a threat to it directly. And it can be a threat indirectly from management who sees that you guys haven't done your policing jobs. And unions haven't found, uh, the truth is the union movement hasn't found a good way around this. For the rank and file then, they face this problem. When they do go out on strike, the international won't support them. It tells them to go back to work. There, there's movies you can see like um, American Dream, the movie about Hormel and the strike over there. You see how the, the international leadership responded. You come up against your own leadership, then you come up against the employer, then you come up against the state. <laughs> That's a tough set of obstacles. But people had a lot to say last week. Well, mentioning the whole uh, Venezuela thing earlier, I am wondering, because as you are saying this, where, where do the, the I mean, obviously, they are spending a lot of money, the capitalists in Venezuela are spending a lot of money on campaigns against Chavez and against Ola. But what is it that What's unusual? Chavez doing that did not take right. them to an immediate investment strike? What is, oh no, they did go into an investment strike. What's unusual about Venezuela is uh, that the state controls oil, that oil is a state controlled enterprise, and it is far and away the largest source of revenue. The Venezuelan state doesn't rely on taxation the way the American state does. It's got oil revenues that can keep it going. So what Chavez did, what, what the opposition to Chavez tried to do, was to break down the oil, was to break down the ability to extract and refine oil. And that would have done away with Chavez immediately. So the first thing Chavez did was he went into the oil refineries and he took them over and he made sure that they would not be shut down. It's very, so now, what Venezuela has, in other words, in our language, this is that the state is less structurally dependent on private capital as against a normal capitalist state. Because in a normal capitalist state is structurally dependent on private investment decisions because private investors control the flow of funds and the flow of resources in the economy. Now, on that logic, any state in capitalism that controls more and more resources directly is a state that's going to be less uh, um, vulnerable to capitalist pressure. So as the public sector expands, the state's ability to set its own agenda will also expand. That's, that's a little complicated, but let me just leave it at that. Okay? It's, it, it need not be true, depending on which sectors you're going into and all that. But, Oil is therefore, oil is really a great commodity to control if you're the state. Which is because once you control it, private capitalists, what, you know, if they only control, let's say, 30% of all investment, they can go on strike. 70% of the investment is still in the state's hands. So it has some measures to counteract that. Now, it's no small thing for 30% of the investment to disappear. And the state's investment will be hit by that. But it's something. It's, it's better than zero, right? So what Chavez has going for him, A, is that. B, he also has sectors of the population that are very, very militant, very organized, and which are able to get that indirect pressure on the state to work, which is employers say to Chavez that, okay, give him something. Because these guys are so well organized, so militant, that their demands could even escalate. And if they escalate, we're facing a situation in which the, a government favorable to them will use that mobilized population to screw us even more. So they become a much more con in a concessionary mood. Chavez has both things going for him. But the oil is at the top of the list. If it wasn't for the oil, he would have been gone by now. Gone. Would that create a rentier state? Is that a yeah. term that's applied? When, when your, your revenue for the state is no. coming not from taxation, but from... Yeah. That's also the source of all the corruption. It's an incredibly corrupt state yeah. because it's these sluices that just have limitless money coming through them. I shouldn't exaggerate. He might not be gone because he has been politically very savvy, but it's, I, it's hard for me to imagine he would have survived the six elections he's gone through these last few years if, uh, if he hadn't had some way of... Well, Lula, Lula personifies the internalization of these constraints that I've been talking about. Lula got into power. The, he just, on the first day, he said, 
All that shit I said the last 10 years, just forget about it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I've got to worry about keeping capitalists happy. So for radical parties, this is the fundamental thing you have to think about. You can vote your party into office, but the moment it gets into office in a capitalist setting, it's not because it's corrupt or sellouts. The logic of the system compels it to turn against its base, to take its base as something that needs to be controlled and not mobilized. Unless, yeah, so I mean the first, I mean the first priority of the parties, of radical parties, is to increase mobilization. I mean, if they focus more on increasing mobilization than getting results in policy first, yeah. then they may stand a chance. Yep. And to put mechanisms in place that make it impossible for leaderships to rein in the internal culture of the party. That's the hard part. I, I was going to say, what, what are some examples of that? <laughs> you have to discover it. We haven't discovered any yet. But it's not like Chavez is going around and uh, expropriating uh, oil fields. I mean, he is still, he's, um, a lot of it is changing agreements so that capitalists still have the perceived agreeable rate of return. You know, so, yep. it's, so it's interesting, it's, it's kind of a, that split between the state and economic interests because while the U.S. state is vehemently that U.S. corporations continue to invest in Venezuela, just on very different terms. Yep. Can anybody explain to me the Venezuelan oil and, and who has it? And have you seen those commercials on TV? So Chevron. How they, yeah, they, they thank you so much for, as well for making my poor family survive the winter. Like, wh I mean, where is that coming from? They really don't it, need it provides low cost heating oil for uh, low income houses. For low income houses. And that was his problem. He came to Harlem and gave his whole speech inside a few days with a bunch of community organizations to provide the Bronx, Harlem, and right. all over the country. Right. He donated it, but Sitco takes an awful lot of credit in those ads. Yeah, and yeah, it's all like, Sitco. Oh, yeah. they do. I mean, they do mention Venezuela, but they. Well, they say because they don't want to put a picture of Chavez. Right. <laughs> 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 but it is largely Chavez who started that. that yeah, project. yeah. But to, I guess th this is all about <laughs> propaganda about yeah, exactly. getting getting yeah. people. Yeah, and that's what I like to look at. So yeah. I guess putting Sitko's name would be more American than. Yeah, it just seems odd when you know Bush and Chavez always have these little, and then we have on our televisions every day the pro Chavez yeah, kind of propaganda. It's not pro Chavez. Yeah, I think the reason why it is. Basically, it didn't say something like America is so rich that you can't think of it as like people, so I'm going to do that. Yeah. I mean, he's not just know. doing that here. Yeah. It's obvious that he's doing the, this here for main propaganda. Main yeah. propaganda. Yeah. Because he, he, they, there's also so many programs that they're investing money into, like taking people over there, taking them in tours and bringing them back with materials and propaganda. Movies, you know, show sure, up, sure. which is that's how I came across it. Somebody came and knocked on my house and was like, You want to see this? Not sure. I was like, I was cool. it's like they show you the protests and all the the the, 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 the mobilization that they have, which is, yeah, very well, huge and melting on your door. With well, it's a neighbor, <laughs> so I don't know. Okay, I thought well, just they were doing like door to door campaigning. Okay. No, 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 but, but <laughs> that's. That's the point that if you come back, talk to anybody you can talk to, school, whatever, you know. Yeah. And that's, you know. But they do that in other, in Syria, I know I have friends who are getting Venezuelan oil. Mm -hmm. It's like they're doing it in a bunch of different countries. Now, what about Bolivia? Bolivia seems to be somewhere between Brazil and uh, Venezuela. Yep. That's about right. I don't know much more. <laughs> 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 They've nationalized the um, natural gas over there right. in Bolivia. Yeah. Bolivia. Bolivia. Um, yeah, but beyond that, I don't know much more. There's a great uh, documentary called Our Brand is Crisis. Hmm. That's by a woman who was in Bolivia when they were doing the, uh, the um, election. And they had James Carvel and other you know, strategists from the U.S trying to get their guy elected, and it, was, it blew up. I mean, they were so sure they'd win. And yeah. you know, somehow, this other guy was, you know, he didn't.
So there are no questions about the actual shit that I said? <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. I mean, cool. What you're saying, it's just more about thinking about how examples and how it actually manifests that I think kind of pulling up those examples are useful. Because this is... Straightforward? Good. Excellent. I had a question. Yes, young man in the back over there. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you talk about mobilizations in this kind of generic sense. Yeah. But what does a mobilization do? I mean, the, the qualifier put on it, exactly, it, it imposes an additional cost in some way on, on the politicians in terms of being responsive to the labor constituency, say, and also on capitalists, the capitalist class of the society. But what, what would those look like concretely? Would they, should be a, would they be a general strike? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I just took that for granted. So examples are like, you know, um, the wave of strikes that occurred in the 30s, um, and the, um, we're going, ranging from the sit-down strikes in Flint, various uh, new tactics that were developed, to the strikes in the mines, shutting things down, basically, so that the stream of revenues that elites depend upon, whether it's profits or whether it's rev taxation revenues, are um, made unavailable to them. Right? And I, I am leaving it kind of generically because I don't want to narrowly say it's this kind of strategy which does it. But I should say that merely shutting things down is not going to give you the results you want. Let me, I've often thought about this, and then this, is, this is just musing on my part, but tell me what you think. I don't think, it's not the case, I think, that once you go on strike, the, as soon as you go on strike, there's a kind of a linear relationship between the duration of the strike and the inclination of elites to give you concessions. I think it actually goes something like this. That um, the, let's, let's call this the inclination to give concessions. And this is the duration of the strike, okay? The, how long it goes. So the higher up you are, the, it means the more inclined elites are to, to give concessions, right? As a strike proceeds, so one assumption would be as a strike proceeds, it'll go something like this, right? That in the first day of the strike, they're not inclined to make any concessions at all. But as it gets longer and longer and longer, they're going to want to give more and more concessions. My guess is it isn't actually like that. I, I think what happens is you, stay at a you start at a certain level, and the initial response on the part of capitalists, I think, will be early on to be very intransigent. So in the first early days of the strike, capitalists in the state will say, smash them, kill them, do whatever you have to. And they'll get more and more intransigent, which means they're less inclined to give concessions. I think after it's gone a certain duration, and once you've reached the point where there is a real cost that you start imposing on people, then the inclination to make concessions might start rising. Yeah? But then I think, there's a point at which it's going to also go in the other direction again, which is when you start getting so radical that it's not simply concessions that you, you're taken to be demanding, but the whole game itself. At that point, the resistance is going to really st set in. And that's the point at which you start risking civil war, um, breakdown of the state, etc. Right? Especially if you look at this at a kind of a national level, not just a level of a firm. So if there's a wave of strikes, what this means is this amount of time, from here to here, the movement has to have the resources to survive. It's internal resources, it's solidarity, it's internal solidarity, strike funds, support from the outside. And this is the time where capital does its most to just destroy you, smash you, bring in the Pinkertons, bring in local cops, whatever it can do. Once you survive up to this point, now, as the concessions start coming in, another dynamic kicks in, which is as the concessions start coming in, some parts of the coalition can start breaking away if they have a more limited range of demands. So the movement can stop at this point or at this point. But if it does get to that top where it starts asking for, for the lot of it, there seems to be a correlating uh, graph of you know, and I hate to bring this up. Capitalist resistance? No. Of, of, no. of, of uh, worker class consciousness. I mean, that must well, I think, I think if, you, if you make it here, yeah. you can't do it. You've got class consciousness. 
here. You will not make it here without class solidarity. Without class solidarity, yes. Yeah. I, I agree. I think there's a distinction though, between solidarity and, and class consciousness, the way that, that I'm working with it. Okay. And so that you, you can have the solidarity in the mass movements that apply enough pressure for your graph to start moving up. But because you said that, that the, the movement will drop out, uh, at those certain points, you know, basically at those reformist points. They start taking those concessions, good enough for us, we're not on the front lines anymore. In order to move that up to, yeah. uh, to the place, yeah. that takes a highly developed level of class consciousness. I so agree. that the actual yeah. reform doesn't diminish right. the mobilization. Yeah, you know, uh, so I think you're right about one thing. Some, some kind of distinction has to be made in the level of consciousness. Um, I would call it, I'm happy to go with what you're saying, solidarity versus class consciousness. Uh, uh, or you could say class consciousness versus class militancy or something like that. But yeah, you're absolutely right, I think, that to reach this point, you actually, it requires an ideological shift. The other source of reaching this point, the other source can be just total intransigence from the part of the ruling class. That imagine that it, it isn't... Um, oh, that they don't give concessions. Yeah, right. that they just say no concessions at all. And quite honestly, I think that's why revolutions have occurred at all. Revolutions have occurred in very backward settings. Right. And the reason they occur in backward settings is workers have no way of getting concessions. And every economic demand is turned into a political demand. Every little demand turns into something that requires humongous mobilization just to get an inch. And since this, if the, the ruling classes are so backed by the state that every little demand requires taking on not just the employer but also the state, capturing state power right from the outset comes at the core of workers' movements. Whereas reformist movements don't even worry about state power. They're just, they're just interested in getting better deals for themselves. That's why I think revolutions have only occurred in backward countries. It's because over there, political and economic power tends to be fused. But about Cochabamba, like specifically this mass strike around water privatization there, the success yeah. of that, yeah. and like, and that's what it ties in on. But I think like, there have been two labor upsurges, you know, really militant ones, in the 20th century. One was in the 30s, and the other was like 68 to 70, 71, which nobody knows about. And the reason nobody knows about it is, I think, it didn't make it past that initial point in the graph where ruling classes uh, are willing to start giving concessions. And it came at a point, 69 to 72, it came at a point where these industries, the auto industry, the steel industry, where these strike waves were really powerful, mining, those industries were in recession, they were getting clobbered. So just as soon as workers went on strike, the plants started shutting down. And the most militant layers of the working class just got laid off. Didn't happen in the new uh, at, towards the uh, when the New Deal strikes took off.